Good evening and welcome to this STEP podcast with questions asked by followers of STEP and answered by Professor Ken Muir, author of the report, Putting Learners at the Centre Towards a Future Vision of Scottish Education. STEP, Scottish Teachers for Enhancing Practice, is an organisation of classroom teachers run by classroom teachers, putting on professional learning events for classroom teachers. It evolved from the Association of Chartered Teachers, a Scottish government initiative now ended. However, the passion and commitment of classroom teachers continues. Indeed, in the feedback sheets after our 2019 conference, one delegate stated, STEP is the best kept secret in Scottish education. But that's enough about us. Professor Ken Muir, currently Honorary Professor of the University of West of Scotland, recently retired Chief Executive and Registrar of the GTCS, former HM Chief Inspector of Education, but firstly, a geography teacher, welcome. Good evening, Ken. Um, Good evening, I'm, Sheila, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Great, now I'm just gonna give the introduction from your report and I'm going to read it verbatim from the report. Following the Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD's independent review into Scotland's school curriculum, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills announced the intention to replace the Scottish Qualifications Authority, SQA, and consider a new specialist agency for both curriculum and assessment. The reform of Education Scotland was also announced with the removal of the function of inspection from the agency. This report outlines the findings from a public consultation which sought views on these reforms and supported Ken Muir to prepare his report and recommendations. So I have read the report from cover to cover and I searched for step in Appendix A, but we weren't there. Uh, I was delighted with the amount of input from stakeholders quoted and which no doubt shaped your recommendations. However, without further ado, I'm going to go to the first question. And our first question tonight for you is, the Scottish Government made major decisions in response to the OECD report. They then commissioned this report to find out how these decisions could be implemented. Was there not enough noise from the stakeholders of Scottish education to enable the Scottish Government to reach the same conclusion? Yeah, it's an interesting opening question, Sheila. And I think one of the one of the things I was very clear in was that I had a fairly fixed remit, as you said in your introduction, the decisions that the Cabinet Secretary had made. But I think in response to your question, I think what came through very early were two things to me. One was the fact that when you look at these two major bodies, SQA and Education Scotland, the influence they have across the system is very significant. And that, in a sense, forced me to look much more widely than the remit itself, hence some of the recommendations that go beyond just SQA and Education Scotland. I think the second thing that came through very strongly, very quickly, was the very thing you're referring to. I got a sense very early on in my engagements, and there were a considerable number of engagements over the three month period. I got a very strong sense that a lot of people out there, in spite of what we have gone through in the last two years in Scottish education, felt that this was absolutely the right time to reflect on where we are and where we want to move forward in, uh, in Scottish education. So I think it was a, probably a combination and a build up of some of the things that you're, you're suggesting taken together with the two years of the pandemic which brought an awful lot of folk to the, the view that in spite of all the anxieties and concerns and, and tiredness that there is in the system, and, and, and undoubtedly it is a fatigued profession, in spite of all of that, there was a very strong sense that we really need to grasp this opportunity and look quite, quite deeply and quite radically potentially at what we want the education system in Scotland to look like. That's great. Thanks, Ken. The next question is going to be posed by Anne. 
Okay, so the question I would like to ask um, is, I'm just reading it from a sheet here. So this, in recommendations one and two, you mentioned that the Scottish government should initiate a national discussion um, what, and reading from your report, establishing a compelling and consensual vision for the future of Scottish education. And that invitation to shape this vision should be um, made to all stakeholders. So how do you see this working? Are you confident that this can be achieved to meet the outcomes outlined in the report? Um, and has this national discussion begun? And how do we get involved? So there's a few bits to that question. Yeah, thanks, Anne. I mean, for me, recommendations one and two are really a, a critical starting point for this exercise because, as I said in response to the first question, you know, I think there is a, a general consensus around the fact that we need to we need to try and replicate what we did 20 years ago with the national debate that produced Curriculum for Excellence. I mean, in many ways, and again, this came through a lot of the feedback, we, we we didn't really, we don't really have the mechanism in Scotland to allow that kind of ongoing discussion and debate to take place that informs policy. And I, I do feel that, you know, in spite of what's happened in the last few years in particular, uh, there, there is a need to look at the kind of education system that we want. I don't think we've got an option with it, to be perfectly frank, because there are so many other things happening out there. Uh, I mean, society has changed, the world has changed, not least in the last mm -hmm. two years, but certainly in the last 20 years since we had the national debate on curriculum for excellence. And, and I very much felt at that time, and some of you were teachers then as well, I very much felt that after the national debate, we had a period of about four or five, six years where there was absolute buy-in to the philosophy of CFE and the direction of travel and so on. And we had a lot of consistency and a lot of enthusiasm and creativity, particularly in the primary schools that started off working in curriculum for excellence. Now, there are lots of lessons to be learned. There are things that we didn't do well enough. Uh, when we introduced curriculum for excellence, we didn't share the philosophy well enough. I don't think we engaged the parents well enough. Uh, I, I don't think when the examinations and new national qualifications came in, I don't think we did enough to explain what they were about as well and how they fitted in with Curriculum for Excellence. And I'm, I know that there are some folk who are very much of the view, as they've told me, that they don't think that they still fit with uh, the aspirations of CFE. But I think we had a period of genuine consensus and quite an exciting time in Scottish education. If we think 20 years on the pace of change that there has been and the extent to which the world and society has changed in that time and the ever increasing pace of change, I think we're, we're duty bound to all learners to, to take a big deep breath and, and spend a period of time reflecting and considering what we want for the future. So uh, those two recommendations for me are very important catalysts for engaging as many as possible. Uh, the mechanism by which that would be undertaken, I think, would be something similar to what we had with the national debate. I know that there is a group within Scottish Government that's looking at how this uh, national discussion, as I called it, or a national conversation, as I've heard, it, I've heard it referred to, can take place. I think, for me, the critical thing in the second recommendation is about that uh, privileged narrative that was discussed within the expert panel. I think it's really important that however this national discussion takes place, we absolutely get to those individuals who are at the sharp end, particularly the learners and particularly the teachers and practitioners. Uh, because one of the main messages in my report is that we need to see a system that is a much more bottom-up hierarchy than what we have got at the moment. And I think if that can be replicated or if it can be set off with how the national conversation or national discussion takes place, then so much the better. But as I say, I know that I'm not directly involved in it, but I know that there is work underway to try and get recommendations one and two underway very quickly. That's great. So that, that's really encouraging to hear that. And also I, I feel when you're talking about that, that excitement or that engagement that there was around the, the conversations about CFE so I look forward to, to hearing more about you know how that's shaping up and then the, the, the discussions that are there. So I'm actually going to ask you the next question as well Ken and as, as a 
well, we're all classroom teachers, but I think this spoke to me uh, quite a bit. So I was really fascinated to read the comments of the young folk that are peppered. At the fact that the report is peppered with real comments from people, and I was particularly interested in the comments from the young people throughout the, your report. There's a couple of things there. I'd like to ask about the, the review of national qualifications by Professor Hayward and what you can tell us about that and how that is, is shaping up. And also, how, how enlightened were you by the comments from the young people? Because some of their comments just hit the nail right on the head for me. Yeah, very much so, Anne. I mean, just in terms of Louise's work, first of all, I mean, Louise has now been commissioned by Scottish Government. She's pulling together a group of folk uh, to organise the, 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 the review of uh, qualifications and assessment. Because I went beyond the kind of parameters of my remit, a lot of feedback that I got around national qualifications from young people themselves, uh, as well as teachers and, and other practitioners and parents for that matter, I fed all of that evidence into Louise's work. As I understand it, Louise has until the end of the year to report back to Scottish Government on uh, what she's recommending by way of uh, qualifications and assessment. For me, the critical thing around assessment in particular is that it's seen as part of learning and teaching. That's one of the reasons why I didn't recommend or go with the recommendation or the consideration that the Cabinet Secretary asked of me to look at the possibility of setting up a curriculum and assessment agency, because for me, that missed out the critical role that makes the biggest difference, which is learning and teaching. So that national agency that I am proposing uh, very much has got curriculum assessment, learning and teaching very much at, at its heart and providing support in those areas and taking feedback from what's working in those areas within the real world of classrooms across Scotland is very much at the centre of, of, their, uh, of their remit. But when you talk, Anne, about the, the young people, uh, I, was, I was heartened by the extent to which some young people seem to be getting a very good deal out of the education system. And I think you all know as practitioners, there's some fabulous stuff happens out there without any doubt, but it's inequitable. And, you know, we can't have a situation, for example, where, uh, and this, this, was, this was something that was said to me often, uh, where it, it depends on who you know as to whether you are able to access high quality support that, that you need, uh, that's bespoke to the, your requirements and so on. So it can't be a case of knowing someone within a national agency who you can phone up and say, we're needing X, Y, or Z, can you come and do it? It needs to be a much more equitable playing field. And there, there were a number of individuals who, who felt that uh, some of the national bodies were unable to provide the level of support or the, or the type of support that they wanted, simply because the offer that these national bodies had didn't suit their circumstances at a local level. So coming back to the children and young people there, I mean, they tell it like it is. You know, it's what you said in your introduction to the question. You know, they're very honest. They're very upfront. Uh, there are some, as I say, that are clearly getting a very good deal. But if you look at the, the uh, Children's Parliament report, because I engaged Children's Parliament, the Scottish Youth Parliament and the charity together, to survey, and it was almost 4,000 children and young people that they surveyed. In terms of secondary uh, young people, been only a third feel that they are getting uh, the kind of experience that they feel they need from the education system. Uh, one third don't think they are, and the middle third are, are unsure or didn't respond to the question. So it, it, that, doesn't, that doesn't send some positive signals and, and I think what, what it demonstrates to me is that and it goes it goes to the, the heart of this culture and mindset shift that I talk about quite often in the report. You know, I think there'll be some teachers who will find the enactment of the UNCRC Article 29 quite challenging because we will have young people who have got rights uh, supported by statute and uh, you know, some of these young people uh, who, who gave comment back to me, and I've got to say there are, there are extremes of comment that I chose not to include within the report, uh, 
are frankly quite shocking if that's the quality of experience they're getting. So I think there is something there. There's a lot of really good things happening in Scottish education. But as I say, for some individual youngsters, they're not getting the deal that they should be getting. And, you know, my analysis of it is that we need to look again and focus more strongly on the quality of that relationship between teachers, practitioners and young people. And teachers and practitioners need to be supported from the centre. The infrastructure needs to point to that support and provide that support when it is needed and in a bespoke fashion, much more so than perhaps is the case at the moment. And you know that there's enough feedback from the work of the regional improvement collaboratives, the work of national agencies and so on to suggest that the level of support that they require uh, and, and the, the focus of that support doesn't always necessarily hit the mark. So young people have been very forthcoming, been very honest. I've been fascinated by some of the conversations that I've had with them, particularly those who have gone through the experience of examinations over the last two years. And, uh, you know, I've urged Louise to engage with as many young people as possible who have had those experiences, because I think there are quite telling comments and quite telling indications as to what a qualifications and assessment system should comprise from, from young people themselves, not necessarily uh, folk from an academic background or from, a, or, or, or dare I say, even from practitioners. Young people themselves have got very creative ideas as to how assessment and qualification should be rolled out. I find it really heartening, Kenan, is, is these, these young folk that feel that they don't have or their education doesn't meet their own particular needs that, that we really need to start thinking about, you know, and start thinking about what we can do for them and what, what the profession can do for them. So thanks very much for your answer, a very frank answer. Thank you. Now, the next question is from Angela. Um, in recommendation 13, you mentioned that a transition programme team should be set up to further plan and detail the and coordinate next steps. Can you tell us a bit more about how you see this group operating and if any discussions have taken place so far about forming the group? Yeah, as far as I'm aware, Angela, uh, Scottish Government are in the process of pulling together a group that will look to take forward uh, the recommendations in my report. And as you know, uh, government accepted a lot of what I suggested by way of my recommendation, didn't accept everything. But as I understand, under Claire Hicks, who is the Director of Education Reform, there are a number of programme groups being set up to take forward uh, the recommendations. I think it's important to stress as well that uh, whilst there is an urgency required, I think, to move forward on some of those areas and the recommendations one and two in the national discussion is certainly right up there is something I think that can happen very quickly. Uh, as I recognised when I wrote my recommendations, there are some recommendations that will require uh, uh, primary legislation. Uh, so for example, and uh, perhaps the best example is the independent inspectorate. Now, as you know, that was a decision that the Cabinet Secretary made to remove it from Education Scotland. I took the view from the feedback that I received, and particularly talking to parents and other stakeholders, as well as teachers, uh, but particularly parents and stakeholders, wanting to see that that independence is absolutely built in to the governance of this organisation. So we, we already have somewhere in the region about 70 inspectors uh, HMI who currently sit within Education Scotland, you would imagine it would be a relatively easy job to move them into a single entity group out with Education Scotland. What I was proposing was that in terms of governance, that independence was enshrined in how the, the body is created. And I was recommending that it is a, a non-ministerial office, which basically means that the, in, the independent inspectorate reports to Parliament and not to ministers. So it puts it on a very similar independent status as the likes of Audit Scotland, for example. And I do think that that gives it credibility. Uh, I think it also gives it the, the level of independence that allows it to talk truth to power. So 
you know, whoever leads that organisation and the inspectors within it are in a position to be able to, to certainly share the good news messages of Scottish education, but also to be quite blunt with the uh, Parliament to say what's working well and what's not working well. So in, in that sense, uh, it's a good example of something that you might imagine could happen quite quickly. Uh, and as I understand, there are steps to, to do some of it just now, but the, the fullness of the recommendation may not be confirmed for at least 18 months or two years, which from what I gather is how long it takes primary legislation to go through uh, Scottish Parliament. So in response to your question, that, that there, there are groups being set up just now to take forward uh, the, the recommendations within the report. And uh, as, as I say, it, it obviously runs alongside further work that Louise is doing very specifically around qualifications and assessment. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question comes from Carolyn. Hi, Ken. Um, out of all the recommendations that are made in the review, which do you think is the single most important in terms of impact? And why would you say that? Yeah, I think, Caroline, that I've said before, I think recommendations one and two taken together, I think potentially has a, have the potential to have the biggest impact because I think if we can create the mechanism to engage folk in meaningful discussion about the purposes of education for the future and the kind of system that we want for current and future learners. And I'm talking about you know, the next generation of learners, who as you all as practitioners know, are very different from you know, our Generation Z youngsters that have come through and Generation yeah. Y before them. I think if we can, if we can get a, a coherence to that uh, national discussion and get widespread involvement in it, we're never going to get absolute consensus around the vision for Scottish education. Uh, but I do think that we, we can aspire to achieve something akin to what we achieved 20 years ago with the national debate. So in some ways, I see that as being potentially the most impactful of the recommendations. Uh, but in the report, as you know, I talk about all 21 recommendations being part of a package. So they all have a role to play in it. Uh, and you know, if all that happens is we have a debate or we have a discussion and uh, not much happens as a result or uh, uh, around the other recommendations, then yeah, I think we run the potential to sell current and future learners short because we do really need to take this, what somebody referred to as a golden opportunity to, to think quite deeply about how we, how we want the education system to work in the future. And uh, you know, a society and global society as well as Scottish society changing so quickly you know, the education system has to reflect that and, and it has to lead as well on some of these changes within society. So I think there's, there's some very deep thinking required, which would point me to recommendations one and two in particular. Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree. And I really like the idea of it coming from the bottom up <laughs> and getting the teachers and everybody involved in what's happening in schools. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think it's also important to remember. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we live in a democratic society. We elect uh, MSPs and ministers and so on. Uh, the strategic responsibility for education will always lie uh, with ministers. I think what we need to look at is how we how we help inform that policy from the bottom up. Uh, and, and that includes, I mean, I know it's a fairly derogatory term, the bottom up, but it includes learners as well. And I think it is one of those things that I hope it comes through the report, you know, that we need to, we need to recognise the role of learners and the say that learners should have, because UNCRC will require that of us uh, in its entirety, not just Article 29. So I do feel that, uh, you know, if we can get that collective uh, agreement around a consensual, as I say, vision, uh, I think that will stand us in good stead. And it goes back to something I say in the report itself, you know, the restructuring of the reform of Education Scotland and the creation of a national agency and the replacement of SQA can only ever be the starting point. They in themselves are not going to affect the kind of change and reform 
that the education system in Scotland is going to have to undertake if we're going to serve learners well for the future. Great, thank you. Thanks. And the next question comes from Donald. This question is about uh, inspections and the formation of an independent inspectorate. Um, what, what difference will an independent inspectorate make if local authorities choose to prioritise different policies from what the inspectors are looking for? Yeah, I think there's two parts to this, Donald, really. Uh, one is I would hope that in the recommendations I'm making about Scottish government directorates and divisions working much more closely together themselves, that the policy that comes out of Scottish government that impacts on schools, A, will be more coherent and less fragmented. And as a result of that, it will be more readily implementable within local authorities. Because I think one of, the, one of the things, it didn't surprise me, but there was quite a bit of feedback on it in the discussions that I had about the extent to which local authorities place their own interpretations on policies that are coming out from Scottish government. That doesn't help anyone. But when I scratch below the surface, the issue as much as anything was the lack of coherence or the fragmentation of policy formulation within Scottish government. And I've been quite open about that. And, you know, I've spoken to senior officials, very senior folk within uh, Scottish government about this. They need to be much better at ensuring that the policies that they are putting into the system align with each other. But I think that would happen more naturally if that bottom-up hierarchy and using the national agency as a forum for find, for looking at what is going well and and with the inspectorate as well identifying what's working well but what's not working as well i think we need all of these bodies working together to try and help formulate the policy because at the end of the day as i say scottish government ministers will always have the strategic responsibility but how those policies are formulated i think could do with quite a radical change uh, and it's one of the reasons why I talk in the report about, you know, culture and mindset shift at all levels within the education system. And, you know, as I say, I've spoken to senior folk in Scottish government about this. Uh, they have a role to play in making sure that the kinds of decisions that are being taken, let's say, in the Advanced Learning and Science Directorate or in the Children and Families Directorate, actually align closely with the kind of decisions that are being taken in the learning directorate and that there is no or there is very little room for misinterpretation of policy and therefore hopefully and this is maybe aspirational in my behalf but hopefully then there's a clarity around what the policy is trying to do because those policies should then align with that consensual vision and and with everybody pointing in the, in the right direction so i think it, it's it's maybe less an inspectorate issue and more a kind of uh, a policy issue and how policy is generated and formulated. But certainly when in, in response to a previous question, I talked about the, the independence, the absolute independence of an education inspectorate. I think that independent inspectorate must be in a position and must have enough independence and em enough credibility, particularly in terms of the leadership of it, to be able to go, go to ministers and say, this policy is not working. Uh, this needs to change. And, and to be able to do that in the kind of way that we did a number of years ago, I mean, when I was involved in the inspectorate, I, mean, I think one of the strengths was every three years we produced an improving Scottish education report. And, and it was quite critical. It was very critical, in fact, of some of the policy areas and how policy was being implemented. So I think if we can get everybody aligned around that vision and we can get sense around the coherence of policy and also the number of policies because one of the things that I did do is ask secondary and primary heads to tell me how many policies whether they were local authority or whether they were Scottish government how many policies on a day-to-day -day basis were they being impacted by and secondary heads came back with an average figure of 40 policies and primary came back with an average figure of 34. That, that, that's madness and one, one head teacher actually said to me, you know, 
I'm, I'm paid ostensibly to be a leader of learning and all I have become is a leader of administration. And we need to get away from that. You know, we need to, and that's very much why, it's why the report's titled it the way it is. You know, it is about everybody focusing on putting learners at the centre and doing all we can to meet their bespoke needs and the support needs of the teachers and practitioners who engage with them. And, you know, to, for me, a lot of the policy aspirations, I think, that we have, and there's a lot of consensus around, you know, closing the poverty-related attainment gap and uh, getting a right for every child and so on. I think a lot of those have stand a better chance of coming to fruition and having positive outcomes if we go back and focus very much on learning and teaching, because at the end of the day, that's the thing that makes the biggest difference, the quality of learning and teaching, the quality of engagement, the relationship that teachers have with children and young people. Those are the things that make the biggest difference out there. And I think some of those policy initiatives or policy directives will be much more achievable if that focuses very much on the learning and teaching situation. Thanks for that answer, Ken. And our final question is, in the report, you refer to classroom teachers leading the charge. Short term secondments would allow this to take place. However, the promotion structure in Scottish schools is based upon moving into managerial roles within establishments. Would this not be the perfect time to reintroduce the charter teacher, the teacher who's valued for staying in the classroom? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question, Sheila. And I do think that, you know, as we, as we move forward, we need to have the experience of expert teachers helping to influence what has been uh, particularly newly qualified teachers coming into the system and using that expertise to support them. Because uh, I know from a GTCS days, you know, the beginning teachers and student teachers really haven't had the same uh, quality of experience in their programmes because of the, the pandemic. And, you know, I know that the teacher education institutions have done all that they can to try and make sure that they're as prepared as possible. But I think the general principle of having expert teachers, whether they're called expert teachers or chartered teachers, or indeed lead teachers, which of course uh, was part and parcel of uh, Scottish government's policy, uh, still to come to fruition uh, in its entirety. Uh, I think the principle of having experienced experts in the system uh, within individual establishments is critically important. I think if you look also at what I'm proposing in my report is that the national agency in itself will not necessarily provide the bespoke support. There's been one of the one of the features I think of the pandemic has been that many teachers have found their own their own salvation where national agencies haven't been able to support them. And uh, national organisations. I mean, you pointed out at the beginning. I'm a former geography teacher. I'm still a member of the Scottish Association of Geography Teachers. Uh, I still get huge volumes of really high quality material that if I was teaching on a day-to-day -day basis in a school in Scotland, I would be using that kind of that kind of material. A lot of teachers have found, as I say, their own salvation through their own formal and informal networks. Uh, and certainly, although I don't talk an awful lot about the regional improvement collaboratives as bodies in the report, I think one of the features of the future has to be much closer regional collaboration as opposed to regional improvement collaboratives, I think the notion of having regional and local collaboration and having the time to do that and to, and to undertake some of the kind of discussions and prepare some of the kind of resources that folk have been doing for many years, let's face it, but having a national agency that somehow or other uh, can help to coordinate and, and in some cases perhaps have the resources to be able to, to uh, support financially, both in terms of cash and in terms of time, uh, some of these collaborations taking place. And if chartered teachers, lead teachers, expert teachers, whoever you want to call them, are, are uh, at the centre of that, or, uh, then so much the better, because I definitely think that there is a role to be played there that, uh, that, will, help to, that will help to get that kind of bottom-up philosophy into practice more so than we have at the moment. There are situations, of course, I and mean, it's not a blank canvas. Uh, there's a lot of good collaboration, a lot of good networking. As I say, there's lots of 
organisations, so there'll be subject or curriculum bodies out there that do a lot of really good work. I think it's about trying to coordinate an awful lot, a lot of that much better than has been the case in the past. And that would avoid some of the, the duplication of effort that came through very strongly in the discussions that I had with a number of teachers who are sitting down, beavering away, working to try and create resources when you know, this, another teacher somewhere else in Scotland is doing exactly the same thing. So I think a lot of that not being centralised, but being better coordinated uh, with the support of, as I say, expert teachers, uh, as they're known in some parts of the world, I think that certainly has to be part of a long-term plan for the future of Scottish education. Thanks, Ken. Well, it brings us to the end of tonight's podcast. I have to say, I hadn't realised the separate inspectorate making it independent, what that would mean, that the answer to Parliament. So that I've certainly learned something tonight. Every night's a school night, clearly. Yeah. Cool. In true teacher fashion, I want to say thank you, sir, for taking the time tonight to answer our questions posed by teachers, one of the many stakeholders in Scottish education. And I'm sure it will encourage many of us to take part in the national discussion. STEP intend to return to a live conference on the 18th of March, 2023 at Stirling Court Hotel. So if you're interested in joining us there, do get in touch via the website, Facebook or Twitter. Thank you and good night. <laughs>